All right, what's up everyone? Welcome back to Structure Free Learning. And in this video, we're gonna talk about shear flow. And in particular, what I'm gonna do is derive a shear flow expression for flexural members, and then talk about why shear flow is significant in terms of built up shapes, and then as well as in terms of a, like a cross-sectional property called the shear center. So to get started, let's consider a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed loading. And you can go ahead and calculate the reactions and then draw the shear and moment diagrams, which will look like this. And let's say for this example, or for the way that we're gonna do this, let's say that this beam, when we look at its cross section, has a really narrow width that looks like this. And so when I look at the cross section, I'll call the width of the cross section T and this the height of the cross section. Well, let's say we took something like a bunch of paper or a bunch of little layers in this cross section. All these layers are glued together. Boom. Like this this I have a bunch of layers glued together to make this beam cross-section and you know the thing about a beam is that when in order for us to have a cross-section act like a beam each of the layers of the beam cross-section have to be bonded together so that when I look at the moment of inertia it's a combination of all of its parts as opposed to a bunch of separate individual cross-sections trying to resist the same loading in any case what we want to look at is the amount of force in between each layer so that we can probably think about how to keep the layers bonded together. That leads to a practical question, like how much glue or what's the strength of the glue that I need to keep these layers bonded together. And so before we get really into that, let's take a slice of this beam or an incremental length of this beam. So let's say I cut out here, I'll call this DX. So here's my cutout on this side of the cut and the height of this has not changed. So this height is still H. And on the left side of this element right here, I have an internal moment. I have a positive internal moment. It doesn't necessarily need me to know, I don't necessarily need to know the magnitude of it, but I just know I have some moment here that causes compression at the top, tension at the bottom. The shear, it's a positive internal shear. And on this side of the cut, a positive internal shear would be pointing upwards. I would have another component and this would be plus dv which i could find out from equilibrium and also on this side i have a moment which is changing incrementally which i will do m plus dm so this is my internal loading of this slice of the beam and i can convert each of these moments to a normal stress just by using the flexure formula so for instance let's say i would call sigma prime is equal to m y over i and then I'll call sigma double prime on the other side, m plus dm y over i. And the m's or the y's and the i's are the same because I have the same geometric shape or same cross-section geometry. So my normal stress profiles for each of these would look something like this. And this is the normal stress profile due to my internal moments or my bending moments so that on my element here with the width dx and my neutral axis through the geometric centroid, which is right about here. On this side of the cut, I have compression at the top, tension at the bottom, and this side has a stress distribution, which is described by sigma prime. And again, plot plus y is defined from the neutral axis upwards. This is the positive y orientation. Whereas on the other side of the cut, my magnitude, if my moment is increasing, my stress profile looks bigger. So here, and again, I have compression at the top, tension at the bottom. And this normal stress profile is described by this sigma double prime equation there. And, and again, the plus y is also described the same way. And this is my normal stress profile for this slice of the beam. And if you're good with this so far, then you're doing great. Now, what I want to do is I want to study or I want to examine in between layers of my beam. So over here, I had, you know, described my cross section when I look at it as a bunch of slices, whereas the thickness is into the page here in this drawing down here. So if I choose to look at an increment, some location 
from the neutral axis. So let's say I decide I'm going to look right about here. Boom, right there. I'm going to cut out. So I want to study this layer right here of my cross section. So I'm going to isolate. I'm going to take this part of my slice and I'm going to cut it again. And I'm going to have a, another free body diagram of just this part with the stress profiles. Then my free body diagram and this face right here is essentially a close-up of this part right here, this side right here. So here I would just have a trapezoid looking stress profile. And then on the other side, I would have this normal stress profile, which would look like this. And this again is the sigma double prime. Here's my sigma prime. And in between, you know, because I took this element and if my whole structure is in equilibrium, any little cut away of my structure should also be in equilibrium. And you know already from looking at this here, just from looking at the moment and this moment plus some increment of change, these two are uneven force results or they're gonna be uneven force resultants. And in fact, I could calculate a force resultant here or this for this volume FR prime. And I could calculate a force resultant of this trapezoidal stress volume, FR double prime like this. First, these two are not the same magnitude. And so in order for me to have equilibrium, I need another force down here. And I'll just call that DF. And just to illustrate, I'll try to draw this little segment in 3D. So this thing would look like here. This is the 3D where this length right here would be that DX and this dimension right here would be this thickness T right there with that cross section. And this is that sigma double prime right here. And this over here on this side is that sigma prime. And that force resultant, these force resultants would be a result or the volume. All right. And and if you, I don't know if you could tell, but this DF would be on the bottom here. Uh, you know, how would I draw that? That would be like, maybe I'll draw a dotted line. Boom, DF on the underside of this element. All right, so hopefully that gives you kind of a 3D visualization. Nonetheless, in order to do this, and which is the way that so many of our derivations are done is by taking a segment and then applying equilibrium. Hopefully by applying equilibrium, we'll be able to see a relationship for this force in between the layers of my cross section. So I'm gonna do some of the forces and the horizontal equal to zero. So I have FR prime plus DF minus FR double prime equal to zero. And the the integral formulation for the volume of this block is really sigma prime dA plus dF minus sigma double prime dA, all again integrated over A. And in this case, this area, this area that we're talking about here is is this is this right here? Is the shaded part right here? You can't see it on that side, but all right. And if we did this with the stress profile, it would actually in a rectangular cross section, it would be the volume of a trapezoid. But nonetheless, here if I substitute the flexure formula to this. I got this right here, and you can see already, I'm gonna have from here, I'm gonna have this term MYIDA. I'm also gonna have a MYIDA, which is gonna have a negative associated with it. So those are gonna cancel out. And if I bust the algebra, I'm gonna get with this DF is equal to just this negative DM over IYDA, and I take it to the other side. So this is DM over I, and this differential change or this, this differential moment is gonna be a constant that can and tick out is not dependent on y and here this will be y d a yes and the shear flow in terms of shear flow we're looking at over the length this amount of force per length of the beam if you will or the length would be if i divide both sides by dx then I would have df over dx equals dm over dx times one over i y dA. And this term right here, it looks familiar if you just came from the transverse shear formula. This is the first moment of area, which we call Q. So we'll just put a Q here. And then if you look at dm over dx, this, the derivative of the moment, is equal to the shear. So this thing right here is really just the shear. This is shear, that is the shear. And if we're, depending on the textbook you have, sometimes they'll use a script F, sometimes they'll use a lowercase Q. We're gonna go ahead and use a lowercase Q for shear flow. This is that shear flow and this Q is equal to V 
Q, capital Q over I. This is a shear flow here. And this is only good when you have very thin sections. And if you if you look at this already, it has units of force over length. So you'll have things like newtons per meter, pound per inch. And if you look even closer, you can see that this, again, this is also equal to tau, the shear formula times T, which you might call like VQ over IT times T if you want to include the transverse shear formula. This would be the same as Q. 